So we're ready to take it away with Norris beginning our program. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Oops. That look right. Hang on, I got to get back in. It always throws me out when that happens. Yes, ma'am. All righty. Well, first off, I wanted to wish you all a good morrow, which is uh, the the typical greeting of the the pilgrim housewife, um, who was also referred to as a good wife. Um, so I'm also want to welcome everyone to the program, which is the first Thanksgiving Herbs in Early America. Some of you may remember that Carla and I presented a culinary program on this topic several years back. Unfortunately, we have no food for you today, but hope that we can still keep you entertained. A little background, um, I've always been interested in history and the role food plays in our various traditions. I was particularly curious about what was served at what is now known as the first Thanksgiving. I assumed that pilgrims and Native Americans weren't serving up green bean casserole or candy dams or God forbid, jello salad. The pilgrims were in a strange new land with few provisions, but an abundance of wildlife and vegetation. So what did they eat way back then? Let's find out. Also, I know it's a little early, but I'd like to start out by wishing everyone a happy Thanksgiving, or as the Wampanoag Indians would have said, Wani ta but tan ta mo ankh. I'm sure most of us remember the basic story of the pilgrims. As school children, many, many, many years ago for most of us, we first learned that, pilg that the pilgrims sailed from England aboard the Mayflower in 1620. After two months at sea, the pilgrims finally reached the new world and landed at Plymouth Rock with 102 passengers aboard. They established the colony of New Plymouth on the site of an abandoned Patuxet Indian village. Sadly, the Patuxet tribe was decimated by disease brought by earlier colonists from Virginia. But the pilgrims did have Native American neighbors, in particular, the Wampanoag tribe, who they would encounter before too long. The pilgrims would learn much from the Wampanoags about their adopted home and how to survive and thrive in the new world. The colonists explored their new surroundings in a state of awe at what was to them a virtual garden of Eden. Plymouth, Plymouth Colony's sixth governor, Edward Winslow, who was among the first colonists, provided vivid accounts of the plenty the pilgrims discovered in the new world. He wrote, for fish and fowl, we have great abundance, fresh cod in the summer and our bay is full of lobsters and affordeth variety of other fish. We have mussels at our doors. Oysters, we have none near, but we can have them brought by the Indians when we will. Winslow goes on to describe how Squanto, a Patuxet Indian who had survived the disease, caught and offered them fresh eels. Squanto would go on to help the pilgrims adapt to life in the new world. Winslow described Squanta went at noon to fish for eels. At night, he came home with as many as he could well lift in one hand, which our people are glad of. They were fat and sweet. He trod them out <laughs> with his feet and so caught them with his hands without any other instrument. Winslow went on to describe the abundance of fruits, vegetables, and herbs that grew wild all around them. All the springtime, the earth sendeth forth naturally very good salad herbs. Here are grapes, white and red, and very sweet and strong also. Strawberries, gooseberries, raspas, etc. Vines everywhere, cherry trees, plum trees, and many other which we know not. Many kinds of herbs we found here in winter. Strawberry leaves innumerable, sorrel, yarrow, carvel, brooklime, liverwort, watercresses, and a great store of leeks and onions. And in case you're wondering, the term salad herbs, or simply herb, was used by the English colonists to describe a broad range of plants, including those grown in home gardens. 
Strawberry leaves, which are mentioned, were used for tea uh, after the Wampanoags taught the pilgrims how to brew the leaves of various wild berries. I have no idea what Carvel is. I tried to look it up. Um, Brookline is also known as Needwell and it's some kind of succulent. Um, so there were some interesting uh, new plants mixed in with the familiar. Despite the abundance of this new land, 1620 was a rough first year for the colonists. Only half of the original group of settlers survived the harsh winter. Many fell ill to what was likely pneumonia. When spring finally came, they knew growing plentiful crops meant the difference between life and death. Governor Ed Winslow, once again, provided the only written record of the first Thanksgiving in a letter to an English friend. God be praised, we had a good increase of Indian corn. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling, so that so we might, after a more special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruits of our labors. They four in one day killed as much fowl, which served the company almost a week. Many of the Indians coming amongst us and among the rest of their greatest king, Massasoit, with some 90 men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted, and they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation. The pilgrims were living and learning as time went on. With the help of their new friend Squanto, the pilgrims learned a way, a new way to plant corn using fish as fertilizer. When fall of 1621 arrived, the colonists were blessed with a successful harvest of native maize. The 52 surviving colonists and a group of Wampanoag Indians decide to celebrate their good fortune with a harvest festival, as the English did back in their home country. Later, that harvest festival became Thanksgiving when President Abraham Lincoln proclaimed it a holiday in 1863. Though we celebrate it now on the fourth Thursday in November, no one knows the exact date of the first gathering, probably sometime between September and November. It's important to note that the first Thanksgiving was not a prim and proper sit down affair. It was more of an outdoor festival. One author actually likened the Plymouth Harvest Festival of 1621 to Woodstock an outdoor celebration that just sort of happened. A smattering of furniture was likely set about, but would have provided minimal seating. Most of the celebrants stood, squatted, or sat as they clustered around fires where the deer and birds were turned on wooden spits. Before we talk about what was probably served, and nobody knows for sure, aside from the fowl and the deer that was hunted prior to in preparation. Let's talk about what we know wasn't. And this was the portion, Aline, where if, if anyone can, I would like to know when you think of Thanksgiving today, what dishes come to mind? And if you could reply and chat um, real quick and so that we can discuss those. Um, <laughs> Hello, Norris, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, from Val Lang to everyone, she said, and from Val says pie, double exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Chelsea yeah. says, I'm sticking with pie too. And uh, hang on just a second. Boy, there's so many answers here. Cranberry, succotash, gravy, cranberry sauce, cranberry, plus uh, stuffing. Autumn says stuffing. Uh, and then she added cranberry. <laughs> Lucinda said, All right, well, that. let's talk about some of those. Um, I, you probably, you may or may not be surprised to know that a lot of these items were, would not have been on the menu. Pumpkin pie, while the pilgrims had pumpkins, they had no butter or wheat flour uh, for crust and little sugar. They brought a small amount of flour with them from England, but it was not a common commodity. So 
pies would have been out of the question at this point in time. Cranberry sauce was not invented until 50 years later. Plus it was uh, not a common dish because it involved quite a bit of sugar, obviously. Cranberries were probably used in Wampanoag dishes or possibly added tartness to pilgrim sauces. Uh, dressing, again, there were no wheat crops at the beginning. And so any kind of dressing would have to be uh, made of corn or cornbread. Um, generally what the pilgrims did was stuff their, their birds with leeks and onions and herbs for, rather than, than bread. Mashed potatoes, well, white potatoes did not, were not grown in the US until 1719, almost a hundred years later. They were native to South America and <clears throat> didn't make it this far north till then. Same pretty much with um, sweet potatoes that came from the Caribbean and Central America. Uh, ham and bacon, pilgrims brought pigs, but they hadn't yet butchered them. They also are believed to have brought laying chickens and goats plus a couple of dogs. But just to clarify, the dogs weren't for food. At least I, I hope not. Uh, and apple pie, we say American is apple pie, but apples were not native to North America. And the first apple orchard was grown in 1625 in Boston. So as you can see, very little of what we have considered traditional on, on our Thanksgiving tables was traditional to the, uh, common to the pilgrims. So, on to the pilgrims. You could describe the Plymouth Harvest Festival as the first potluck. The colonists supplied wild ducks, geese, turkeys, swans, yes, swans, and passenger pigeons along with cod and sea bass. The Indians brought gifts of deer, native birds and game, fish, shellfish such as lobster, mussels, clams were undoubtedly part of the fair. And these are all assumptions given um, to what was available there at that time. Early Plymouth writings also mention eating eagle and crane. More than likely, there were Wampanoag foods of roasted wild duck and roasted goose. Venison sobaheg, which is a Wampanoag stew, was probably served, as well as nasaump, a dried corn porridge. Mussels seethed or boiled is what that seethed um, translates to, and stewed pompion, which was the word for squash and pumpkins. No one knows if there was roasted turkey that day, but wild turkeys were plentiful and eaten by both the native Wampanoag Indians and English colonists. Game and fowl was stuffed with onion, leeks, and herbs, not bread, as I mentioned, and then spit roasted or boiled. There would be simmering pottages, which were stews into which meat and vegetables were thrown. The table was probably loaded with native fruits like plums, melons, grapes, and cranberries, plus local vegetables, such as leeks, wild onions, beans, Jerusalem artichokes, and squash. English fare was often served with a gravy or sauce, such as mustard, also called divers, which was very popular, or sops of onions, a dish that's made by cooking onions in butter until soft and caramelized. And it, you can see in the picture some very uh, appetizing looking baked eel, along with stewed turkey with herbs and onions, stewed pompion and the seized mussels. Colonial cooking required ingenuity. Though the pilgrims had brought seeds, plants, and some food stores, they had to wait for their crops to take hold and flourish. This forced them to look to the land and the Native Americans who resided there, the Wampanoags, for guidance. As a result, the food of earliest America encompasses traditional English recipes using wild plants and herbs, as well as Native American crops and cooking techniques. Contrary to common belief, 17th century English dishes were anything but bland. 
Cooks at the hearth made skillful use of a variety of herbs, spices, dried fruits, and beer or wine. They also had access to sweeteners like Nantucket honey and saps from various trees, as well as certain herbs and plants. The colonists also brought a supply of culinary staples to see them through the first winter or until the next ship arrived from England. These included oatmeal, dried fruits and nuts, vinegar, oil, salt, lemon juice, and anise seed water. They also brought a good store of dried spices, including cloves, mace, cinnamon, nutmeg, and pepper. If you look at the recipes from this period, you'll notice that a lot of them call for vinegar and cloves in particular. It was a very common seasoning technique. Every home had a kitchen garden. Though medicinal herbs would be a priority, the pilgrims also brought seeds for basic culinary herbs to be used by the English goodwives or housewives at that time. Pilgrims also brought seeds to plant English vegetable and herb gardens, as well as larger crops such as barley, peas, and wheat. Home gardens were often planted with herbs as, such as parsnips, collards, carrots, parsley, turnips, spinach, cabbages, sage, thyme, marjoram, and onions. Both the Wampanoag and the pilgrims gathered a variety of wild herbs and vegetables. The Wampanoags taught the pilgrims about how to identify and use native vegetables and herbs. As you'll notice, many of these plants are known and used today. From the Wampanoags, the settlers learned to use strawberry and blackberry leaves, sassafras root, bee balm, and birch bark for tea. So what was the beverage of choice back then? Supplies of beer and wine were limited, so most likely the pilgrims washed their dinner down with water, though that wouldn't have been their first choice. Beer was the go-to beverage for everyone, including children. The pilgrims believed, and rightly so, that water was often contaminated and made people sick. The distillation process killed most parasites and bacteria. The English colonists grew a few acres of barley, but given how long it takes to brew and ferment beer, it seems unlikely they would have had any made by that time. Wine may also have been drunk, as was aquavit, uh, a more potent alcohol. Cider would become the, new, the main beverage of New Englanders by the mid 1600s, but as previously mentioned, in 1621 Plymouth, there were not any apples. At this point, I wanted to give a nod to Squanto who made Thanksgiving possible. He was really key to their pilgrim survival and got credit later rather than sooner. So I wanted just to take a quick look at some of the dishes that were popular during pilgrim times. As previously mentioned, sobaheg was a very popular common dish. It's the Wampanoag word for stew. Variations of this dish are still made in Wampanoag country today. It, ingredients include dry beans, hominy, turkey meat, green beans, winter squash, and then raw sunflower seeds or walnuts are pounded to a coarse flour, which is stirred into the stew to thicken it. Another popular item was nassant or uh, samp as the pilgrims called it, which was a thick Native American porridge that was made of cornmeal and berries of any variety or a combination of all were stirred in along with crushed nuts and sweetened with maple uh, syrup. Another very common dish was stewed pompion, which as I said before, pumpkin squashes were all in that same Pompeian family. Um, it was one of the earliest written recipes from New England. It was considered a standing dish eaten every day or even at every meal. 
they cooked the squash, mashed it, added cider vinegar and some ground ginger and salt. Curd fritters were another popular item. Uh, they were made like thin pancakes or crepes or crepes. Um, this recipe includes wheat, which was not readily available, but the, the fritters could also be made with corn flour and sugar. So probably these would have been special occasion items on the menu. So in conclusion, as we gather this Thanksgiving, let's follow in the footsteps of the pilgrims and the Wampanoags, eat local, eat fresh, be flexible, have fun and count our blessings. Oh, and wear our masks, socially distant, and have, an, have a happy, healthy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Norris, for that wonderful half of our presentation. Um, we'd like to go now. Yes, thank you, Autumn, for clapping. <laughs> now we're going to go to the second half of our presentation, which is Carla's uh, take on uh, herbs, traditional and Native American herbs, um, herbal medicine, the history of herbal medicine in early America. So take it away, Carla. All right. I will share my screen now from my PowerPoint and hopefully that works. <laughs> uh, share. And play from the start. Okay, I think that works. You can see my screen. Okay. Indeed. Let me know if you can't see the PowerPoint. Um, so the first settlers um, originally were called first comers or forefathers. They weren't actually called capital P pilgrims until 1800. So these first comers um, from England. Uh, oh, weird. I, my arrow's not working. Uh, let's try this. Um, yeah, so Norris covered culinary and then some aspect of that was for flavor. Um, they had a limited amount of foods and you can make it taste better with herbs and also to prevent spoilage. They used a lot of the herbs um, to um, preserve the food because there wasn't that much and you had to be really careful with it. And also nutrition um, with the limited foods um, and there was no citrus in there at the time. You know, a lot of those green herbs have good amount of vitamin C and even some of the herb roots have good amounts of nutrients. And then the medicinal use, it wasn't just folk treatments, um, trial and error, that kind of thing, that also brought physicians and books with them and seeds with them. So there was some based on the physician uh, use and a written history. And the herbalism was pretty sophisticated in England by that time, even though it was largely medieval. And then also household use for herbs, dyeing fabric, um, making things smell better in the house, insect prevention. So those are the kind of things that I'll talk about. Um, for culinary, um, these are a few of the herbs. Norris mentioned some also, but these are the, some of the native plants that they eventually used. Um, different types of mint and even Russian tarragon, uh, juniper berries, wild onions, those kind of things. And then um, we'll get into a little of the history of medicine in the 1600s. So you understand where these settlers were coming from it and the ideas at the time of how they use these herbs. Cause we use some of them the same way nowadays, but um, why and what were the theories behind it that we might've lost and not really understand. So there was two main influences for a long time in history it was Galen, a Greek physician talked about the doctrines of um, humors, these substances in the body, and we'll talk about the four humors later. But also the term botanical simples came from him, um, using plants to treat those humors, um, as well as other methods. And then in the 1500s, right before the pilgrim, the settlers came, there was a famous European physician, Paracelsus, who really got away from that old style of thinking and used more chemistry for specific diseases and you chose what to treat with based on the doctrine of signatures or the doctrine of similars, the law of similars that we know about today. And um, so Galen was pretty early on 
and illnesses arose from the imbalance or impurities in the four humors of the body. And those were bile, black bile, blood, and phlegm. And that was based on, you know, early cosmology that a lot of cultures have, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, early um, Mediterranean medicine. The earth consisted of things like fire, earth, air, and water. So they saw those in the body. Was there heat in the body? Was there phlegm in the body? And the treatments were pretty harsh at the time. I mean, the herbs were probably the best treatments because otherwise it was bloodletting and doing things to induce vomiting or purging the bowels or sweating to get rid of some of these humors that were out of balance. Um, so it's, that was part of the influence. And then you had a physical constitution and a psychological constitution or temperament based on that as well. But the main thing to understand is that he used contraries to treat contraries. If you had an excess of black bile humor, then often you would be told to drink a lot of white milk because it was contrary. Or if you had a lot of heat in the body, you would take cold herbs or you would be purged. Um, so even today, herbs like senna that we use for constipation come from that tradition of purging the bowels when someone had an excess of a certain humor. We don't think about it as balancing the humors, but we still use it the same way. We use senna for constipation. And some of our language even comes from his theories. Like we say someone's spewing bile when they're angry or someone who's kind of sluggish and slow is their temperament is called phlegmatic. So we still have a lot of those influences today. And um, Galen as well as Hippocrates thought that food was very important. Lifestyle, exercise, food was the first medicine you should take. And so he classified every single vegetable according to the four humors and different degrees of cold and heat and dryness and wetness. And then we get our word herb simple from Galen's work, um, the Latin word simplicibus. And um, that eventually in turn to just mean an herb. And now we use it as a single herb versus a formula. And then similarly, um, using a decoction or infusion of herbs used to be called a galenical in the early English times. And Galen didn't just have these weird ideas about humors. He also actually did anatomical dissections on animals because humans were not allowed at the time. And he even realized things like blood flowed in the arteries, whereas 400 years before that, they thought air was in the arteries. And he also discovered many nerve functions, but he also had a long wrong ideas because um, animals aren't quite the same as humans. So it took a while before we understood more about medicine. And then what happened right before the settlers came over was sort of the starting of the Renaissance from the medieval times. And there was um, Paracelsus was a famous Swiss German physician and alchemist, which is an early chemist. And he attacked Galen's ideas. He thought there were distinct diseases, not just categories of heat or bile humors or something. And they each had their own causes and their own cures. And he reclaimed this ancient doctrine of signatures that explained why certain products would cure certain diseases. The plants, animals, and minerals God gave us all showed their signs for what they would be used for and what they'd be good for. And he published a famous book in the 1500s um, soon before the pilgrims came. And um, so this doctrine of signatures, which we call the law of similars now is pretty important to understand. Um, the texture, shape, color of the minerals and animal and plant products were indicators of what they could be used to treat. So the saffron, the orangey yellow stamens of the crocus flowers or a yellow turmeric root or even the mineral topaz would be used to treat jaundice, which is yellowing in the body. And walnuts are shaped like brains, so they would be used for brain and head ailments. Toads uh, were used to treat wart-like skin ailments like smallpox or even syphilis. And then red bloodstone, an actual stone mineral, it was used to treat hemorrhage bleeding because it's red and scorpion grass, which is the old name for a forget-me-not, was used to treat the bite of the scorpion because the seed pod resembled that nodular tail of a scorpion. And then there's also a related thing called sympathy cures. Like if you got bit by a rattlesnake, you could kill it and then eat the rattlesnake liver as an antidote. So those are the kind of ideas that were, were in play when uh, the settlers came. Um, so the, uh, let's see. 
Yeah, so now we come into actual, this is where I geeked out a little. We have actual historical documents from the time um, of the Mayflower landing 1620 into the mid 1600s. And, uh, oops, yeah. So uh, we know, uh, we have a record that on board the Mayflower, one of the colonists brought this book translated in English called A Brief Epitome of the New Herbal. And it was a translation from the famous Dutch physician, Dodens, and he had studied in Italy and all over Europe. He was really a major doctor at the time. And the Mayflower ship's physician, Dr. Samuel Fuller, we know who he was, and um, he had access to that book. And then um, only, you know, less than 10 years later, uh, in 1597, before the pilgrims came, the most famous English herbal, John Gerard, um, wrote a book that was pretty much based on Doden's books, but it got the general history of plants. So that was all knowledge that they brought with them, as well as the seeds and um, the folk medicine and the professional physician medicine. So... Uh, we have an actual letter only 20 years, less than 20 years later of a letter written from a doctor, Edward Stafford in London to Governor Winthrop of Connecticut. He was the son of the Governor Winthrop of Massachusetts. And it covers 20 different disorders and 24 herb cures. And you will see in this letter a lot of evidence of that mix of these ideas of the similars or the humors and the contraries. It was all mixed at the time, plus folk medicine. So this letter is pretty interesting. Um, these are the kind of receipts for different illnesses that they had. And some are illnesses we figured out what they are in modern times. Like falling sickness was probably epilepsy or another seizure disorder. Bloody flux was dysentery and jaunders was jaundice. And then also, you know, injuries, smallpox, poison fevers, um, probably mastitis from sore breasts, um, wounds, and even TB. So these are the kind of diseases you talked about in this letter. Because this is an actual page from the letter. And you can, it's handwritten. It's really fascinating to read. And you can, I could read it pretty well. It's, the spellings are different, but you cannot understand it. And it actually says, for disease of the bladder, give the party to drink, if it be an inflammation of heat of urine. And this is the key here, that idea of the heat in the body. Um, give them an emulsion made from barley, husk, almonds, and the four great cold seeds. And those were uh, pumpkin, cucumber, watermelon, and gourd. They're all seeds of fruits, which are watery and cooling, um, kind of similar to heat clearing medicines and yin tonics in Chinese medicine. So this cooling remedy for heat was differentiated from the bladder disease he mentions next in the letter, which would be for a patient who's not thirsty, not drinking, not urinating much, but this heat person would be thirsty and drinking a lot and peeing a lot, even though they might have pain and burning. Um, so they would get different remedies um, for sort of the same bladder disease, but different constitution, different internal conditions. And then they also use poultices. You can see barley meal or the roots or leaves of Aaron. I can't quite figure that out. Um, Aaron's rod was the name for that tall stalk of the mullen plant. So the leaves of Aaron were mullen leaves. And, um, and also interesting is we do get our expression cool as a cucumber from this idea of these four cold seeds in Galen's type of medicine. And then um, also in the letter, the next part talks about um, urinary or kidney stones. So they're saying for the stoppage of the urine or a stone, let them drink a decoction of maiden hair, fern, fennel roots, and parsley roots. And it's interesting, parsley roots we'll talk about later. Um, it, it was more of a food, it was a different type of parsley that was grown. But then uh, next he talks about um, Oh, yeah, interesting thing. But they were saying before you give them these fennel roots and maiden hair, have them drink two or three ounces of almond oil newly extracted, or let him swallow a quarter of a pound of new butter made into round bullets and cast into water to harden them. And I would imagine if you had a stone, then all that oil and butter might help it to pass. And then the next thing he talks about here is the bloody flux, which was dysentery, which involves blood and diarrhea. 
So you'd say purge first with rhubarb. And we know rhubarb is a bowel purgative. And he said torrified, and that means roast, dry roasted. And then give them to drink twice a day, a pint of this caudal. And a caudal was an old English beverage, often made of wine or ale with sweet egg or sugar and egg and thick things in it. It was popular from medieval to Victorian times. So you'd make a caudal and he'd say, take a dragma. That means a, a dram, it's an old English weight measurement of bowl armoniac. And that was like a clump of dirt um, or clay. And it was often red or treated with iron oxide to look red. And then also a dram of santalum rubrum is red sandalwood and a dram of sanguis draconis. That's a red tree resin. Uh, so these are all red herbs you notice that treat bloody diarrhea. So we're using that law of similars here in the treatments he's mentioning. And then the letter goes on to talk about 24 more herb remedies. Um, you can see some of the ones we talked about, but also things like um, the yellow herbs uh, would treat jaundice and then uh, the flexible twigs of witch hazel and elder would treat broken bones because you wanted those bones to be uh, straight uh, but flexible again. And uh, um, those were the kind of books that they used at the time. The first medical book published in colonial America wasn't until much later in 1708. It was a reprint of Culpepper's famous English physician book. So until then, they relied on books that more settlers brought from Europe, but also um, a lot of home remedies. So most of the women were the primary health care providers in the family, unless you needed some physician for something more serious. And they had to grow or wild harvest most of the medicine themselves. The physicians sometimes imported things like bull or maniac, but a lot of the herbs um, they had to grow and they brought the seeds with them. So they could use the English remedies they knew. And an uh, account in 1692 states that the typical gardens there had 15 herbs that were currently used in English medicine too, like burnet and ground ivy and feverfew. And the thought at the time was, you know, use the English herbs for English bodies. We know these, we're these people. Um, but then there was also a popular view at the time that they embraced more later, saying wherever you live and what climate you live in, uh, and get those type of diseases, that place where you live will also have cures growing there that you can use. So that explains things like why jewelweed grows near poison ivy and it's an antidote and why um, plantain, rattlesnake plantain grows near snake dens, it's an antidote for the rattlesnake bites and why dock grows near stinging nettles. Uh, so these are cures already in place. And then some of the native herbs they also use and even started to be exported early on. Um, the New World cinchona bark was for uh, malaria. And they also learned from Native Americans use. And Native Americans also used a lot of this doctrine of signatures. So when they shared ideas about herbs, they understood each other. So the uh, Seneca tribe used snake root for rattlesnake bite poison because the root resembled the rattle of a snake, how it was shaped. So this similar philosophy allowed them to share their knowledge pretty easily. Um, so the settlers brought medicines and plants and the doctors and those ideas with them. But after a while, they, they got sick of using a lot of complicated European physician remedies. And they started using more about local plants, plants they grew or themselves and having the women healers um, treat the families as much as you could. And then some of the native herbs became very popular enough to, even to be exported even before the, the pilgrims came. Um, as early as 1588, the early explorers reported about sassafras and tobacco and what it could do for the body. And then sassafras was one of the first exports to England in 1602 from Massachusetts, well before the pilgrims even came. And then we get into the actual herbs, the medicine cabinet. Um, they use things like comfrey. They brought that with them for healing bones and wound poultices. They brought calendula, also called pot marigold, and they used it to stop bleeding and an ointment from the blossoms heals wounds and stings. And then um, we have garlic. Um, it, 
it was considered to ward off evil spirits because they still had a lot of these spiritual beliefs for medicine as well as physical. Um, it was brought by the settlers. There was also a native variety that um, the Native American Indians had used for digestion and intestinal worms even, as well as snake bite. And then they brought valerian, plus there was a similar native variety, and they knew it was a nerve sedative and it helped you sleep. And the Native Americans used it as a wound antiseptic as well. Now we have chamomile. There were different varieties. They brought some and there was some already here. And the flowers are made into a tea for digestion and colds and aches. And a syrup of the flowers is made for jaundice or edema. And then we have goldenrod. This was a Native American herb and it was tea for intestinal disorders. And this was a Native American plant. They use it as a poultice for bruisers. And then the early settlers and physicians started using the juice of the fruit as an eyewash as well. Um, now sassafras was that important export of Native American plant. And this bark had used by the Native Americans for fever and rheumatism. And therefore it was thought to be good for malaria um, by the Europeans. And the oil was actually used as an antiseptic in dentistry and right up until the 16, 1960s, when we discovered it was a carcinogen, the oil was used to flavor root beer um, and gums and toothpaste. And then we have spearmint and there are other varieties of mint that were already here, but the leaves were used as a tea for nausea or to induce sweating. And mint is used that way in Chinese medicine as well. And then the leaves were used to freshen the breath. And they also used plantain that was brought by the settlers a little later in the 1600s to stop bleeding for cuts and bruises and snake and insect bites. And then we have bee balm. It was used as a mouthwash and to treat bee stings in those early times. And they also had catnip for stomach aches and head colds. And then these are herbs that were used in the colonial kitchen gardens that maybe we don't eat or use as much now, but they're still interesting. Um, whorehound was important. It was brought by the settlers and it was considered an anti-magic herb as well as being used for lung issues. Like it's a good expectorant for cough and asthma and even TB consumption. And they also used that for poison, snake bites, mad dog, rabid bites. And then, um, Angelica as a tea with, from the young leaves and all the other parts of the plant, the root and the stem, et cetera, was used for bronchial problems and colds and it calmed the nerves. And they also chewed the stalks for digestion and it turns out they actually contain pectin, which would be good for your digestion. They also brought winter savory with them. It was a diuretic and antiseptic. You could use it for stings. And they also used it to flavor and mask the unpleasant odors of the foods they had to eat to survive like cabbage and beans and pork. And then uh, ladies mantle. These flowers were used by the colonists for women's complaints. And then they used the dried leaves to stop bleeding. And it turns out they actually contain tannins which um, are styptic and actually stop bleeding. And then hyssop is important. Um, it's important herb in history. They did bring this with them. Hyssop was considered a sacred herb and used to clean temples and holy buildings in early history. And they um, used it as a strewing herb in the home because it, it, if you stepped on it, it brought out this pleasant fragrance when they had you know, dirt floors and didn't get to clean much in the house. And then the tea um, from the green, the tops of the green before the flowering was used as a gargle for sore throats. You could drink it for bronchitis. The ground leaves were as a poultice for healing wounds. So this was an important herb for them. And interestingly, um, the essential oil from the leaves and the stems was used to flavor perfumes and in digestive bitters and even in the liquor chartreuse. And nasturtium is another important herb. It was also called Indian cress. It originated in Peru and was brought by the Spanish conquistadors in the 1500s to Europe. And then it made its way pretty quickly to England and then the settlers brought it to America. The name Nasturtium means nose twister because of its pungent odor. And the 
leaves and flowers have a peppery flavor and could be eaten raw or in salads. And um, the leaves are actually most tender before it even flowers. But the seeds also could be pickled. You'd gather them from the pods, then you pickle them to keep them. And even the pickled flower buds were used like capers. Um, borage, also known as bee bread, because bees are the only pollinators of this, was considered a herb that a cheerful herb that brought courage to a person. So they had psychological benefits to herbs they knew about as well as physical body illness uses. Then this infusion of flowers was for fevers, bronchitis, diarrhea, used as a diuretic. And even violet was used as an herb. Um, the oils were used for perfume. The flowers put into little sachets were used um, near your pillow to help you sleep or for anger even, or for headaches or hangovers. And uh, another important herb was clove pink um, or gillyflower or border carnation, we call it now. Um, the flowers were used to flavor wine and ale and also used in syrups and jams and they could substitute for cloves and potpourri. This was brought by the settlers. And the name of the color pink comes from this flower, not the other way around. There was an English term pinkin with a Y that meant um, pinking shears, like scissors with jagged edges. And the leaves of this have those jagged edges. So that's why the, this herb was called that. And then later on the color name pink came from this. Um, also fennel, the bulb was used mainly for a food but they also made a tea of the crushed seeds for indigestion and cramps. And that's still used today. People you can go to an Indian restaurant and you'll see a little bowl of fennel, whole fennel seeds to chew for your digestion after the meal. Um, another important one was parsley. We saw in that letter from 1643 that they talked about using parsley root as a medicine. And at this time, this is the type of parsley they used um, in Europe a particular variety of parsley root, also called Hamburg root, was eaten as a food. And this comes from a subspecies of garden parsley that's a particular one. You can eat the leaves, but it's mostly grown into these thick tuberous roots. You can um, slice it or shred it and eat it raw. You can steam it, roast it, saute it, um, make um, a puree of it as a bed for roasted meats, um, chop them and add them to soup or stews. And this was important because this herb actually has a lot of vitamins and minerals and nutrients. It's really high in vitamin C, the root, not the leaves. And it also contains B9 folate, as well as potassium, magnesium, zinc, phosphorus, and even some iron. And it also contains antioxidants like vitamin C, but also these other really important antioxidants called myristicin and apiol. So they fight off free radicals. So this was actually a big health tonic as well as an important food. Now thyme is native to Mediterranean and it was brought by the settlers. They used it for flavoring foods, but it does have antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory properties. And the same thing with sage. Now this is salvia officinalis, um, it, that type of sage. The North American native sage, white sage used for smudging. That's a completely different sage that grows in the West on the American continent. So it wasn't used in pilgrim times in New England, even by the Native Americans there. And basil is a really important herb. Historically, it's been called the king of herbs. And this is sweet basil. Basil is native to India and came through Europe and then to America by the settlers. Um, there are so many varieties of basil, but this sweet basil that they used was used historically for all sorts of things and considered to even have magical powers. Uh, the Egyptian mummies used this for embalming and it was considered a spiritual protective herb. And it also, the remedies it was used for were um, things like uh, in colonial times, they mostly used it as a remedy by drying it and powdering it and then snuffing it up their nose for headaches and colds. And it was also believed to cheer the spirit and clear the brain, probably as a snuff, it would definitely do that. And another important herb that we don't think of as Native American 
because it comes from Siberia, but it grew across um, Eurasia and into North America before Alaska separated and the continents separated. So it was here in North America. And this is the Russian version of tarragon, not that French version. Um, and it was used for snake bite as well as for flavoring foods. And this was because those serpentine like roots was a similar to, you know, a snake, but obviously it, it didn't work. It wasn't, it's not actually a good remedy for snake bite. So sometimes the law of similars doesn't work too well, but um, this was something they found and used. And then marjoram was brought by settlers. Um, in earlier times, marjoram was even more important than oregano, even though they're quite similar. And even before hops was used in brewing beer and ale in medieval England, they used marjoram. It was to flavor and preserve the brews. And it was also drunk as a hot tea, even before the true tea leaves, Camellia sinensis, came from China and then India later on and were very popular in England. But before that, they used to drink this as a tea. And marjoram was very fragrant. It's more fragrant, but less flavorful than oregano. And it was often added to snuff too. Um, then rosemary was also applied as an oil of the flowers for scarring and skin spots, and then a compress for painful joints and muscles. Dandelion was eaten as food, but the dried roots were roasted to drink as a beverage, almost like coffee, and the tea leaves as a tonic and uh, a tea made from the roots was good for heart, heartburn or as a diuretic. And obviously the French name pee in bed is we know it's a diuretic. And then the blossoms were also made into a wine. <clears throat> and this was naturalized they brought from Europe, but this was one that became popular and the Native Americans also started using it. And then we come to household use of herbs. Um, uh, used for cleaning, like strewing herbs or polishing, and then to repel insects and vermin, and also to dye fabrics. Um, strewing herbs is something we don't do nowadays, but they had dirt floor or rough wood floors. They didn't have vacuums. They didn't mop. They might sweep every day, but um, things were kind of smelly where they lived. So they would want to protect their home and its contents from insects and mice and um, have it smell better. So they would strew these dried herbs on the floor and then they'd every time they walked on it, it would crush it and release the fragrance. Or they'd put these herbs in amongst their clothes to protect them from insects. And we might think of using lavender, but at the time they also used basil, rosemary, chamomile, pennyroyal, lemon balm, marjoram, and hyssop. Those are all popular herbs for fragrancing and strewing. And then marjoram, because it's so fragrant and you can get oil from the leaves, they would take a bunch of it together and rub it on any wood furniture they had as a furniture polish and it would also make things smell good. And margarine was also used to scent and protect fabric and also put into pillows. And um, tansy is another herb we don't think of much, but the fern leaf tansy is a good bug repellent. They hung bunches of it in colonial kitchens to repel mosquitoes and other bugs away from their food. And they'd strew it on the floors to ward off insects. Um, and then I, it was also used, um, yeah, for roundworms and digestion problems. And then also another use of herbs at the time was dyeing cloth. At first, clothing and dyed cloth to sew was brought from England, and it was expensive. So pretty soon on, they brought undyed cloth and dyed and sewed it themselves in the new colonies. And clothing was usually made of plain muslin, could be flax, hemp, or wool fabric. Cotton only came later on when it was found to grow well in Southern America, but they didn't have it at the time to grow there. And then uh, maybe you'd have silk clothing for your best that you would store away with some of those herbs to protect it from the moths. And then they could use the natural dyes to recolor items of clothing that were stained. But as you'll see, a lot of these are kind of light pastel colors. So we have here on the left is the plain undyed muslin. Sorry, this is a little blurry. And then we get into parsley is pale yellow, chamomile pale yellow, yellow dock, Root gets a little more orangey yellow, and then walnuts a little orangey brown, 
bloodroot got reddish orange and then blackberry could get purple or gray depending on whether you were dyeing wool or cotton or hemp and then um, these are other dyes plant dyes they used at the time uh, to get uh, yellow brown gray sometimes green um, they even use things like onion skin marigold um, goldenrod dandelions ferns and um, marjoram as well was the one of the few that would get you a darker reddish brown on linen and then on wool, it would look purple. And um, golden seal was also a native American plant they found and it has these flowers and also these more colorful berries. And it can produce a pretty brilliant yellow dye that the native Americans used on their clothing and weapons and as face paint. And then the settlers started to use this as well as a dye. And we also have calendula um, we learned that as a medicinal herb, but they also used it to color the white freshly churned butter to look more yellow. Like maybe when the certain times a year, the cow's milk is better and the butter looks more yellow, but the rest of the time they would actually color it with marigold. And it was used to dye fabrics and also in salves for dry hands. And um, I hope that's been enough information for you <laughs> on the colonial use of herbs for household and medicinal uses. Thank you so much, Carla. We're going to go right. These are both wonderful presentations. And in the chat screen, I've been noticing as you were talking, many kudos from different people who have been watching this, all saying it's an outstanding combination program. Um, a couple of the quite, and of course, people all had many different uh, recipes and ideas that they use for Thanksgiving, most of which we've talked about. John Fine did ask a question about, uh, for you, uh, Norris, about was there a source of milk for them to use in Thanksgiving recipes or whatever? Um, I don't see any recipes that have milk. And I don't think they brought dairy cows um, till another trip. But that one segment I read said they brought goats, possibly, and chickens. Um, so I would assume that unless there were buffaloes and they milk those, I don't, <laughs> but I don't see it showing up in any recipes. Yeah. Well, buffaloes were, were plains animals. So I right, right. <laughs> unless they went and collected them, or, you know, brought them out, whatever that Native Americans had. I was, thinking, goat, I was thinking goats would be good. Uh, yes. Yeah. The animal and so on. Yeah, I think as time went on and there were different voyages, you know, that would come, they would bring more, more items. Um, okay. Next, sheep's milk too. The next question was from Judith Kraft. She wants Norris you to put the recipe for soba egg on the screen again, but I'm thinking it might just be something that we could put in the, the uh, newsletter some of these different recipes, I'm sure there was one I was interested in. So okay, they could yeah, I was thinking about that too. Right. So I'll, I'll give a, um, provide an, a, a link to. to All people. right. Um, Lucinda asks, she says, women used to be described as having the vapors. Does this tie in with the theories of Galen for whoever wants to answer that? Either Carla or Norris. I would think Carla maybe. Oh yeah, I don't know. I, I would guess so. Um... I'd have to look up that and what they meant by the term the vapors, but I, I think it has more to do with that humor, humoral type of medicine. Um, and there were lots of antiquated theories about women's health at the time. <laughs> a lot of these really, guys didn't really understand a lot, but um, yeah, if someone was fainting or that would be considered having the vapors, I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sylvia says, Many thanks to both presenters. Obviously, you both did a lot of research and presented such informative and interesting programs. Um, someone asked also um, about that parsley root. Is it related to parsnips? And I was kind of wondering that myself. It looks like parsnips. Um, it does look like it, but it is a true parsley, one of the true parsley species. Um, if I can find the... It's called, uh, scientific name is 
Petrosalininum crispum tuberosum. So that's it's grown the one that's grown for the root in common across Europe even today. They use celery root and parsley root a lot more than we do. Elaine asked, Elaine Betterman said, parsley root, can we get it now and perhaps sell it at the Herb Society? And Val said, <laughs> <"Sell it in." laughs> you'd have to get seeds for that very specific species, though. I don't think you can grow our normal parsley in, in the root of that just won't get as big and won't taste the same and be good for pureeing. Right. Okay, well, that's about all the questions we have time for now. These programs were so wonderful. We uh, are delighted you were able to present them both in their entirety. Mm -hmm.